senior fellow at the Peterson Institute at the moment, but um, most of you know him better as a former chief economist at the IMF and before that um, uh, at MIT. So, uh, Olivier, I hope you can hear me. Very good. Um, we hear you loud and clear. So, um, thank you for agreeing to do this, Olivier, um, in these difficult times. Um, I understand you will be talking about fiscal policy primarily, and um, Anna will guide you through um, how to upload your presentation. So, I hand over to Anna now. Can you yeah, others? Happy to, uh, happy to do this. Uh, uh, Luke had asked me to talk about policy in general, I thought that uh, given that I was talking to the ECB, I would talk about fiscal and not monetary policy, uh, so that I have a slight comparative advantage. Um, this, the third slide just has a number of, of caveats, which are obvious but important. The, the first one is that uh, as economists, we're very much second fiddle. The whole issue is the dynamics of the pandemic and the effect of the measures that we take to uh, slow it down. And uh, we just have to respond to this, and there's enormous uncertainty, and we understand that. The second is that, uh, with all due respect to the ECB, uh, and the main tool is clearly fiscal policy. Uh, there are larger issues. I mean, the role of the state versus market, I think, in response to large shocks, is a kind of a meta issue that somebody hasn't muted, so I, I, I hear a lot of background noise. Good. Um, and then I think the, the whole issue of scaling up, which we see in, in many, in many uh, dimensions in this crisis, which we have to think more about, given that we may have to do it again. The focus of the talk will be mostly normative, which is what fiscal policy should be, although I find that in practice, actual policies are fairly close to what I think they should be, which is very good news. And then the last caveat is that uh, at this stage, I'm more or less a one-man team. Uh, with a lot of uh, interactions, but uh, new no RAs, so they, the days on which I had 200 people to help me uh, are gone, and therefore it is not as impressive, at least visually, as it would have been otherwise. Okay, let's move on. Uh, next slide, then. Right, because I don't have control of it. Okay. through three slides about the epidemic. I'm not in any way a specialist, but everything we say depends on that. Uh, I think we all agree now that there are kind of two phases to the, to the dynamics. The phase one is controlling and then decreasing the infection rate. And then phase two, which will last longer, is how to keep it down. So on phase one, I actually largely think that the story is largely in. Uh, there's a relatively uncer little uncertainty about when we're going to have the infection rate stabilizing. Uh, it's around now. In some countries, we're just past it. In some countries, like the US, we're not yet there, but we're very close. And then the, it's very likely it's going to decrease. And uh, based on what we know, by June or July, we should be at low infection rates. Uh, I think on this, clearly, uh, this is largely baked in. Uh, and fiscal policy can't have much effect on it. I think that uh, it could go wrong if confinement is stopped too early, but that's, I think, a very likely outcome. Next slide. So this is phase two, which is uh, keeping the infection rate low uh, for, for hopefully forever. And on this is uh, an enormous amount of uncertainty. Um, there are good and bad news. Uh, the good news is something that you may have looked at TomTom uh, -tom actually measures traffic in all major cities in the world uh, hourly, and you can look at how it compares to what it was before uh, the uh, crisis. And this one gives you the traffic in Beijing, and if you can see the, the light blue line is kind of normal traffic in the past, and the red line is uh, traffic uh, last week, and you can see that the red line is actually quite close. Uh, to the blue line, which is an indication, and given that we don't believe Chinese statistics always, these, I think, are believable, and they tell us that uh, it looks like they have largely returned to normal, not during weekends, which are the two days at the end, but otherwise, yes. Now, 
how does this translate to us, to uh, advanced economies? And basically, we don't know. It's going to depend very much on, as we all know, on the availability of tests, the true value of so-called R0, uh, the length of immunity. And we're just going to go at it slowly. All countries are basically putting in place uh, various uh, ways of doing it. Uh, we're going to need rankings of people, uh, of type of work, of sectors. The last remark is here. I think there's some work for the economists. This is kind of, this is a bit in a bit of a joke, but not entirely. Economists were very much involved in the Second World War in choosing bombing choices for Allied bombers, and the question was how to do maximum damage, what needed to be destroyed first. And I think we're facing the opposite problem, which is, you know, we can reopen schools, we can reopen manufacturing, we can reopen airlines and so on. What is the best way of doing it? And I think there we can probably contribute to it uh, in, a, in a way which might be useful. Next slide. I've said so far is about advanced economies, and it's completely different for developing and emerging market countries. Uh, they have, a, a, as we know, a very poor health system. Now, on the other side, they have a younger population, so maybe less exposed. They have warmer weather, but we have no clue as to how much it matters. Uh, it's very hard to impose lockdown uh, in, in the cities, in the slums, even more. Uh, I worked last week on Nigeria, uh, which at this date doesn't have many reported cases. There are probably many more than that. But if you look at the number of beds per uh, thousand people, it's uh, one-fifth of the U.S. Uh, as of... Uh, a few weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, they had 169 ventilators uh, for the states of Nigeria. We could get data on, uh, which is clearly nothing, and they had performed 600 tests, which is clearly nothing. So I think there the dynamics of the epidemic are likely to be largely different. Uh, it's more likely to be of the herd immunity dynamics, the ones that the UK thought about for a while and then wisely retreated for, from uh, which means a very large number of deaths at the beginning, maybe a smaller short-run cost. This was the case in the pandemic of 1918, where the economic cost in the short run was much smaller than anything we see today, but probably a larger long-run cost, uh, as has been confixed kind of in a number of papers since then. So that's the background, and now we turn to fiscal policy. So. The way I think about it, and I don't think it's very controversial, is that there are three roles for fiscal policy in advanced economies. Again, I'll come back to the emerging markets, developing economies at the end. <clears throat> the first one is infection fighting. Anything we can do to basically you know, stop the, the, uh, the spread of the virus, that's obvious. The second is disaster relief of people, of firms, and although it's not yet on the list in any obvious way of financial institutions, because at some stage, some of them will be in trouble. And then the third is aggregate demand management, which is making sure that we try to operate the economies close to potential, knowing that potential is lower, uh, but trying at least to get there. In a normal recession, uh, the only goal would be the third. Uh, but in this one, clearly the first to dominate uh, given the nature the nature of the shock. Um, for e I'm going to go through each of these, uh, insisting on what I see as the challenges, the intellectual challenges, and therefore the policy ch challenges, and the time dimension of each one. Okay, infection fighting. So again, go uh, through phase one and phase two. Phase one, you know, fiscal is not, is not central to it. It's basically how we can mobilize all the health resources we have um, we clearly have to spend the money, but it's not, it's not much. It doesn't make a gigantic uh, uh, difference. And what's essential is clearly lockdown and, uh, and doing everything we can in the health system. The, the phase two is much more interesting. Uh, clearly, there are enormous incentives uh, from a social point of view to have tests, to explore drugs, to find vaccines. And then there's the issue of whether the private sector will do what we want it to do uh, without state intervention. And that's not obvious because it's a risky, very, in particular in the case of vaccines uh, and the development of tests. These are very risky ventures in which you may have to spend a lot of money in order to get there. And it's not clear that they'll do it. 
uh, there is the issue of what you do when a firm succeeds and has a patent and then sells it for a very high price. You probably don't want this to happen. So there we have to think about how we do it, and we can probably do uh, uh, better than than uh, than just letting letting the the market uh, do it. Uh, we can probably uh, have the state promise to buy the patents when the firms find something, rather than them having the patents and, and, and making money out of it. Uh, we can think of a state giving grants now to firms which are trying, with the grants being payable back if it works and not payable if they are not. I think there we have to do much more because, as I'll argue in a minute, I think the scale of what needs to be done is gigantic. And uh, the private sector is clearly doing a lot, but maybe maybe we can help. There is a computation which is uh, quite uh, uh, provocative by Paul Warmer, who argues that if we had enough tests, and these are virus tests, not antibody tests, uh, if we basically did enough tests, uh, we could actually get uh, R, or R naught as it's known, the reproduction factor, below one, without confinement, without lockdown. And he makes some computations, which I think one can argue with, but he concludes that if we could do daily daily tests of 7% of the population uh, every day, uh, which is 22 million death tests in the US, then this would actually give us R not less than one and, and would uh, limit uh, the infection rate. Um, I've done some computations. He did some. I did some by uh, having uh, information from producers and so on. And I'll just go to the bottom line, which is that machines probably producing the number of machines we would need would cost less than a billion. Here I have an estimate of 250 million, but uh, 240 million, but I think it would probably cost more. But basically with a billion dollars, we would have the machines we need for the US. The production cost at this stage is about $35. Uh, it could probably go down if we did on that scale to 20. So the marginal cost daily would be about 0.4 billion, which is clearly a gigantic number for tests. But if you think about uh, this allowing an increase in output of 20% or even 10%, 20% would be 10 billion a day, which is clearly orders of magnitude greater than the cost. And if it was 10%, it would be 5 billion would still be 10 times. So there's the idea, if you could do it, it actually makes sense. It's kind of a, a gigantic moon landing or Mars landing project. But it is, it may be doable. And clearly, we have to think about going in that direction. Bottom line, in terms of fiscal, is that if we did everything uh, that we can do, uh, it would still be a very small proportion of GDP. It's very hard when you put all these measures in to get numbers which are uh, uh, greater than 1% of GDP. So this needs to be done but from a fiscal point of view. It's not where the money is going to be spent. Next slide. So the disaster relief, uh, basically the idea is that you have a lot of people who basically don't have the cash to go on for uh, without revenues for a long time. Same thing with firms. And you have to help them. And then there is a gigantic trade-off between speed and targeting. You really have to do it quickly, uh, within a few weeks, uh, a month or two at the most. And targeting is very, very hard to do, given the tools we have. So I think we've done maybe the best we could do. Uh, but clearly, as time goes, uh, that's where economists can come in. We probably can do better in getting kind of better targeting, maybe for less money. We spent, we basically are going to spend a lot of money uh, because of the bad targeting. And so it makes sense to actually think of which programs uh, develop, you know, thinking about it now, implementing them over time. There are basically two approaches conceptually. The first one is in the US, you let people be laid off, and then the unemployment offices do the best they can, and then the state sends checks and gives tax breaks or tax uh, deferrals. Um, that is not working very well because of the information, again, the scaling up for the unemployment offices, the addresses for the checks. France has taken a different approach, which I think is better, uh, which is to do it through firms and basically tell the firms, well, you continue to pay wages. Uh, basically, you pay 80% of the old wage. Um, and you'll get automatic credit from banks, 
And so banks have to be ready to extend credit for this amount and a bit more. Uh, uh, and then the banks are, are going to be backstopped by the fiscal authority. So if they lose money on the credit, then they'll be reimbursed. And then again, a series of tax breaks. I think it's substantially better because at least in the first step, uh, you get people to get the checks. Unless the firms really don't have a penny and the banks take time, uh, it's more likely that money will be delivered. Now, it's turning out to be difficult for the banks to actually extend credit to firms, even knowing that they are fully uh, backed. Uh, but I, th I still think it's better. It keeps the link between workers and firms so they can be uh, re-employed fairly quickly. Uh, but I think we're all trying different things. We'll, in the end, know uh, what works better. Uh, <clears throat> it's very clear that one has to err uh, on, the, on the very generous side. Uh, you know, the cash payments in the US are going to many people uh, that truly don't need the cash. Uh, and the replacement rate in France of 80% uh, is very high and basically may well deter some people from going back to work and things like this. Um, should it be grants or should it be loans? That's a complicated issue. I think uh, grants is probably the way to go if you do loans. People are never sure that they'll be able to actually repay uh, their ambiguities, and I think it's going to lead people to be too too careful ex um, Can we do better? Yes. Uh, I think we can we can do better over time. An issue which I don't have on the slide, because I actually didn't send you the, the latest version of the slides, um, is the exit strategy. Uh, and I think that very soon we have to think about it and think about restaurants. As long as they are on lockdown, then it's clear that you basically have to give them enough cash to survive, right? So you have to pay the workers and so on. But at some stage, lockdown is going to uh, be relaxed and restaurants are going to be allowed to open under some conditions. It's very likely that for a while, both because of the recession in general and because people will not want to go there, uh, traffic is going to be very low. And even eventually, it's very likely that the number of restaurants which have to close is fairly high. So at some, at what point do you basically, you know, undo, uh, take take the plug away? Uh, and 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 let restaurants kind of do it on their own. Uh, clearly, you don't want to do it at the very beginning because at the beginning, you know, people are just not going back, but they will eventually. And the economy is very poor, so uh, laying off workers is probably not a great time to do it. But you have to do it over time. My sense is we have to think about this as economists and maybe limit the amount of backstop of of banks over time as a function of both the economy and maybe the the sector that we, we're dealing with. But that's, I think, one of the challenges which, which is coming. Uh, upper bound on the cost. Um, this was a computation I made. It gives an interesting number, which is, you know, the question is how big is the decrease in potential output and therefore in output, because this is a hard constraint, uh, on the strict lockdown. So you basically don't allow non-essential firms uh, to operate. And there is now a good now cast estimate for March of, in France, and basically the conclusion is 35% decline relative to baseline. So if you assume that we have two months of lo complete lockdown and six months at half lockdown as the economy kind of goes back to something like normal, if you assume that the proportion of liquidity constrained firms and workers is 40%, you can be much, much more refined, but that's a simple computation. If you assume that the replacement rate for workers and for firms is 80%, that turns out to be 5% of GDP. And I've made fairly generous assumptions. Now, that's in, what's interesting is that the US program is already twice that. And I think this says that it really is not very well targeted, and it's giving money uh, to people and firms which probably don't need it. Uh, I think there is an interesting issue there as well to, to explore. The other programs in the rest of uh, of the world are closer to 5%. That doesn't include the automatic stabilizers. So in that case, the automatic stabilizers would probably add about 5%. Uh, and so you basically have numbers about the deficit of about 10% of GDP for disaster relief. Next. OK, so the, the third one is kind of a standard one in normal recessions, but here it's only third. Uh, 
And I think we have to distinguish between phase one and phase two. And again, there are interesting issues here. Uh, phase one, you know, if output is down by 35%, take the number of the previous slide, there is no way you can get above that. Uh, you can increase demand as much as you want. It's just not going to help. Uh, and so there is the question of, well, could it be that disaster relief, which needs to be done, is actually going to lead to too much demand? And the answer is that it well could. You can think that basically you're replacing the income of the workers and they're going to keep demand more or less the same and that's going to be too much given the constraint. I don't think it's a major issue. It's something we have to think about uh, because people are going to probably spend largely on food, on repaying mortgages, not on trying to buy things which are no longer produced. So I don't think it's a major issue. If it turns out to be an issue and there's rationing and there's some inflation, well, rationing is not bad. Uh, rationing actually would kind of lead to a distribution in which the people have more time to actually queue or do whatever it takes, are likely to get it as opposed to the rich, which we think is probably a good thing. And then some inflation uh, would do good things to real rates. Uh, I don't think it would be major, but would not hurt very much, would not be a major issue. The Phase two issue is, is, uh, is again interesting, which is as the lockdown is relaxed, uh, will private demand uh, you know, go up or down? And I think there are two things at work. Uh, there's pent up demand. It's very clear that we, we see it uh, in the disaggregated data and people are not buying all kinds of things that in normal times they would and eventually will. So I think at the beginning, it's probably going to play a role. But behind that, my sense is that there's so much uncertainty about how we go back to normal that it's going to lead to precautionary saving and it's probably going to lead to low investment as well because of the option value of, of waiting. So I have a sense that it may be complicated but after a burst we may actually have a low demand and then a need uh, for uh, further fiscal fiscal help if what is in place is not, is not enough. Uh, I think the implication in terms of policy is that we should not commit to things which imply large public spending or low, uh, or, or low taxes before we actually know what we need to do. And so here, a remark which is going to displease some people, probably not at the ECB but elsewhere, which is this is not the time to plan a major green investment plan, for example. I'm all in favor of it. I've argued for it. I've said public spend, public investment is of the essence. But for this particular purpose, that's not what you want to do. You probably want to think about putting it in place at some point, maybe later, hopefully later, but not now. Good. Let's move on. Okay. We come to the to somehow uh, maybe the big issue, which is debt sustainability. Uh, so is that sustainable? Uh, it, you know, how much will the debt increase? Uh, if you're optimistic, maybe 20% of GDP. If you're pessimistic, uh, 30 to 40%. If you're incredibly pessimistic and you think the virus will not be uh, eliminated, then God knows what happens. But in that case, you know, it's a different world and that doesn't much matter. And the debt issue doesn't much matter. There are much more worrisome things to think about. So my sense is, a fairly unambiguous yes for advanced economies. I think that is sustainable. And that goes back to what I had been obsessed about uh, for the last uh, year and a half, which is uh, you know, the comparison of R, the safe rate, and G, the growth rate. Uh, in passing, I now realize that there are two competing R's. There is the R map of the uh, epidemiologist, and then there is the R star of the economist. But both are very relevant in this case. Uh, as you know, R star, and therefore R, was very low before uh, the crisis. If you looked at the yield curves, they were, pla they were flat all the way to more or less infinity. Uh, and I have a sense that it's going to be even more the case uh, now. Precautionary saving is going to be higher, if anything. Investment probably is going to be lower for some time. So I have a sense that we're going to have very low R star and therefore very low R for a long time. Now, going against that, you have the effect that you know, higher debt probably increases the underlying R star. Uh, 
if you think that the increase will be 30 to 40 percent of GDP, uh, then you have to assume something about the effect of this on R star. We basically have no clue. Uh -huh. uh, somebody has to mute again, maybe. So, okay. Uh, so, uh, the estimates that we use, but I really we, we have to be realistic about the fact that we don't know. Uh, somebody has to mute again. Uh, is two to four basis points per percent of that uh, to GDP ratio. Okay. In the worst, if you many machine, that is twenty uh, percent. So twenty percent in calculate. Sorry, uh, is this a question or is this is uh, an unmute thing? Somebody asked about 30 to 40 percent, but I can't decide whether that's because of on mute or because uh, it was a question. Luke, tell me. Um, I think there was an on mute. We'll take questions at the end. But yeah. Okay, good. Anyway, so the, the bottom line is in the worst case, uh, I think this would lead to an increase of 160 basis points, uh, other things equal, uh, which is not nothing, but I assume that the other effects would still dominate, would still remain with a very low R. Uh, the other part of the equation is G, the growth rate. I see no reason to think that it's going to be higher or lower uh, after 2020, 2021. So my guess is that that is sustainable, but and back comes the next slide, where you, where you guys come in, which is, I think that it is sustainable, but to make sure that it is, the central banks really have to do a lot. Uh, and here I want to take two Two themes. The first one is this discussion about monetization of deficits, which I think is largely confused. I, I had a, a short piece with Jean Pisani Ferry uh, yesterday about that. Uh, the point is, yes, we actually see a very large increase in central bank balance sheets at this stage, uh, and people are very worried, and some people are very worried about this. I think the point is that monetization today, which is an increase in central banks, uh, holdings of other things, uh, and an increase in, in central bank money has to a first to a first order zero effect and we're basically exchanging two assets they both pay zero now if you care about the details it's clearly not exactly offsetting but it's very close so it really doesn't make any difference it, for some reason and I think it's fairly far far in the future the R star the neutral rate uh, must become positive because then it's the responsibility of the central bank to increase R and so to basically make you know make sure that they do what they need to do from an economic point of view. And then they'll have a choice, which is they can do what the Fed did until the crisis, which is that they increased, uh, they increase R and they pay interest on money. And then money is just like that, right? So in, again, it doesn't make much difference whether the central bank bought a lot or not. Basically, they have to pay interest on money. Uh, so it doesn't make much difference and we don't have to worry. The case in which it matters is that for, is for political reasons or other reasons, they decide that they really cannot increase uh, R and they keep R at zero uh, so that they don't have to pay interest on money. They don't have, and, uh, and then it's very likely that if R star was positive and you keep the rate at zero, then the economy is going to have a heat, there's going to be inflation, and in the worst possible case, maybe high inflation, and that's clearly the way things started uh, in, in Germany uh, and doing the great hyperinflations. This may happen. Uh, we have no clue. Uh, I think it's a very, very unlikely outcome, but it is not a zero probability outcome. For the moment, I think we should not worry. Now, where central banks play a very important role now is in avoiding multiple equilibria. So in Many markets, including sovereign bond markets, are typically, not typically, but very often, there are two equilibria. Right? There's a good equilibrium at the safe rate, that, that service is reasonable, that is sustainable, and therefore the safe rate is the right one. And then there's a bad equilibrium, which is the investors start wearing a whole lot, they ask for a spread, and the debt service becomes very large, and that becomes unsustainable, which self-fulfills the worries of the investors in, 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 in the first place. Okay. We have all seen these models, but they actually correspond to reality. And in this case, it's clear that what the central bank has to do is to make sure that we don't get the bad equilibrium. Right? So how does it do it? Basically, it basically commits to keeping the rate 
you know, if not at the safe rate, there might be some very small probability of default, but at a very low uh, level. Uh, the extreme case is uh, yield curve control, which is what the Bank of Japan is doing. You just say, tell your rate zero, and I'll just intervene. And that surely eliminates the bad equilibrium. It also deters investors from trying because they know that the Bank of Japan will be on the other side. Now, that's relevant for the ECB. Let me just say a word about this. Uh, I wish the ECB did yield curve control, but it cannot, and I think for mandate reasons, uh, to do it. They have done the next best thing, which is to say we have a lot of money and we'll basically make sure things are okay. And that is very likely to work. It's likely that's good, and it may lead you to actually spend more because investors may think that's not enough money, and they may try to actually uh, go above the limit uh, and win. Uh, I think in this case, the ECB would probably increase the amount of money they are willing to put in, so I'm not too worried. Uh, there is a very interesting issue, uh, which clearly is central uh, for you, uh, uh, which is the uh, discussion which is taking place about whether the ECB commitment is enough, or you need the SM ONT, or you need uh, corona uh, bonds, or euro bonds, or whatever you want to call them. And I think the discussion is, again, muddled. It seems to me the important question is, do you think that is sustainable at, at a safe rate, or at a lower rate? If you think so, and then the, what the ECB is doing is fine. If you don't think so, if you think that that is actually not sustainable in Italy, then the ECB cannot do the job because the good equilibrium is not so good and trying to maintain a very low rate is, is a recipe for disaster, for taking credit risk, and the ECB should not do it. So I think the people that think that that may not be sustainable clearly uh, must want uh, something stronger than what the ECB is doing, namely either just a ESM program or, 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 or your bonds for mutualization of risk. I, I would feel much better if, uh, I mean, I think the ECB is probably enough, but I'm not absolutely sure, and therefore I would like to see more in case that turns out not to be sustainable. Again, I don't think that's the case, but, you know, better safe than sorry. Uh, let's move on. Okay, so the last slides about, are about uh, emerging markets and developing economies, and then the scope for inter international institutions and, and coordination. Um, and the situation, you know, you've heard this, but it's really true. It's, it's a, a situation for the, many of these countries is terrible. And there are some similarities with uh, advanced economies. I mean, they, have, they are fighting the same virus. Fiscal policy should have the same free goals, but there are major differences. They are just not equipped uh, to fight the virus. I've talked about this. They have large capital outflows. Uh, not so due to, not so much due to worries about them, but the need to repatriate liquidity or perceived need to repatriate liquidity. They have FX dominated debt, denominated debt, a fairly steep demand curve for government bonds uh, that limits very much what they can do. They have a very large drop in commodity prices. There is this stupid uh, oil price war, uh, which. Uh, that, you know, it's really uh, happening at the wrong time. Tourism has disappeared. So they're in, in terrible shape and they don't have fiscal space. And so it's very clear that existing debt may have become unsustainable and that they just don't have additional private borrowing uh, available. So I think for many of these countries, there is a liquidity issue right now. And then there's clearly a solvency issue uh, for many, many countries already now. Next slide role of central banks, international institutions. So in the short run, it's liquidity, right? So swap lines, size and reach, I don't need to discuss it. I think it's obvious. It's happening, probably not quite on the scale I would like. There is an issue of allowing private creditors uh, out and therefore having capital controls on outflows. Uh, right now, uh, there is a trade-off. Uh, I think uh, debt restructuring is, is the solution, but in the short run, this may have to be done. Uh, next point is also an obvious one, which is the, the financing of the infection fighting should be full grants of very concessionary uh, loans. Uh, that's already happening, not on the scale which is sufficient, and therefore things like SDR allocations, or even if there are no SDR allocations, the gift or lending of the SDR allocation by rich countries to poor countries 
could go a long way. I think something like this is needed. It's needed right now. I know it's being discussed at the IMF this week. I think it's important. Uh, the medium one, uh, clearly this is the solvency issue. I think in some cases it's obvious that uh, that is not sustainable, but in many cases it depends. You can't quite, you can't quite tell. So uh, that stands still as much as it can be done is the way to go, but for those of you who have worked on these issues, and I'm thinking of Luke here, uh, you know, there are so many types of creditors that coordination is a big issue, uh, but something like this has to be done. Uh, how much conditionality to impose on programs, it seems to me that, again, conditionality should be very limited. It should be allowed to fight the virus uh, and not do anything crazy, obviously, but uh, this is really special. Uh, one issue here, which is not on this slide, is that if there is debt restructuring, uh, this means that creditors are going to have to uh, accept a big haircut. And uh, for official creditors, they can, but for private creditors, that might be an issue. And we should already be thinking about the effects of debt restructuring on the advanced economy's uh, financial system to make sure that it can actually handle it. It's not completely obvious. And I think there has to be work, and I haven't seen it yet. Last slide. Coordination. Now, you know, it's standard at any G20 meeting or G7 meeting uh, to have, uh, to invoke the need for coordination. And I'm not so sure that there's a gigantic role for coordination, at least for fiscal coordination. We can discuss the others. You clearly have to have coordination in mobilizing and getting funds to uh, emerging markets uh, and developing economies. That's very clear. Whether you call this coordination of gift giving, I don't know, but it's essential. There has to be coordination in sharing information because both on the pandemic side and the fiscal side, we're trying new things. And countries are going at it in different ways so that a place like the IMF or the ECB or uh, for Europe basically has to you know, show how each country is doing and what the results are. I think that's very important. Uh, coordination in determining, determining the size of fiscal programs, uh, my sense is no. Uh, in 2009, uh, I, was, I was a fairly strong advocate of, of coordination because the issue was moving aggregate demand. And when you have economies which are very open, when you increase aggregate demand, a lot of it spills over to other countries and you may not want to help them, you want to help yourself. So I think when it's a standard recession, it makes a lot of sense to have coordination to basically increase fiscal policy in each country. It's not obvious that in this case it's very relevant. If you think about the two goals of fiscal policy, the first two, infection fighting, disaster relief, you basically do whatever it takes for your country and you don't care. So I don't think that spillovers are terribly relevant here. Uh, so I'm happy we talked about fiscal programs, but I don't see any need for coordination in the usual sense. The last point, and this will end, uh, an issue which is likely to, to really uh, play big and, and, and be very difficult to solve, is that there's going to be a need for a lot of tests, a lot of vaccines, and there's going to be fighting. And you already see the fighting for the masks today, which is a much smaller issue. You know, the US is stealing or bidding and getting the mask and uh, that other countries wanted to have and so on. It's already ugly, but, but it's going to be much worse. If you let markets decide, then, you know, the rich countries will basically buy the test machines, the vaccines, and so on. And then within the rich countries, the rich people will get them. So you don't want that. You want some agreement, both to subsidize, and I go back to the one of the early slides, uh, subsidize research and production and development. Uh, and then you also want the states to allocate it. Uh, you want some allocation across countries and within countries. Uh, I think it's a, you know it would be dreaming to think it will actually happen at the world level. It should, uh, but it can probably happen at the European level. And I would hope that uh, that that there would be an agreement as to uh, how you know tests and vaccines are distributed if there are not enough of them. So let me stop here. Uh, Sorry about the delay at the beginning and the, the small the small problems along the way, uh, but um, I surely have time for a few questions. So please go ahead.
Many thanks, Olivier. Um, so everyone that still wants to ask questions can add them to the term is on uh, the material that you presented on the lockdown. So Alberto Martin, uh, you know Alberto well, of course. So he's asking, do you see any role for the price system in choosing which sectors to open up first? So, I mean, you mentioned the role of economists in deciding which sector should exit the lockdown. And uh, this may be hard to do top down. So do you see any role for the price system in this process, for instance? Would you want to let sectors or people purchase permits to exit the lockdown? Um, could the state maybe decide on the overall speed and then could the price system um, uh -huh. decide via markets on which sectors should exit? Um, I think the answer is, in, on, on the, I've not thought about the, the issue. It's, it's a fun question. It's an interesting question. Um, do you still hear me? Because I seem to have disconnected. Absolutely, yeah. It's just the presentation yes. slide went wrong. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, just thinking in real time, I had not thought about it before. Uh, the answer is absolutely not. I mean, unambiguously, because of the externalities, it's absolutely obvious. Uh, but there's still something very interesting to do, which is basically to think about the marginal cost or the marginal benefit of opening different sectors. So, in the privacy of our offices, uh, in the privacy of Alberto's office, I think that looking at what the marginal benefit of opening, social marginal benefit of opening this sector rather than that sector uh, is something that maybe we should be doing, doing. but allowing the price system to play any role into uh, who gets back to work and things like this strikes me as uh, politically uh, uh, unwise and uh, economically unwise. And Berto is welcome to come back with a rejoinder, but maybe this should be bilateral. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting issue. Okay, then there are a series of questions, uh, not surprisingly, on the fiscal role of central banks. Um, the first question is um, whether you are, since you're not, you not, don't seem to be worried about debt sustainability, but are you still, since the conditions vary, widely across your area countries and the ECB seems to each time have to kind of make up for this promise. Are you not concerned about the risk of rollover crisis? So will it become increasingly difficult for the ECB to, to support the good equilibrium and will the ECB be tested? Um, so uh, clearly I had in mind Italy. So yes, my, st my statement is I think that that is sustainable with very high probability in all countries, including Italy. I, about two or three weeks ago, I had a long thread and, and then a slightly more serious paper on the issue. I think it's perfectly doable. And Italy can run, you know, very high debt to GDP ratio and still run a primary deficit. So there's no need for something crazy to be done. Uh, so I think it can be done. All of the crisis, that's very much what I talked about. And basically, I think that's the case in which yield curve control is the way. Uh, and you basically say, well, you, you know, I'm just going to go in. Now, investors, some investors may want to get out, in which case, indeed, the ECB will be holding some of the bag. But much of the idea is to basically prevent kind of a self-fulfilling world of a crisis. It may be that some investors will just not want to, to buy Italy. It may be. Uh, but I think may, the main issue is that they may get scared, in which case, you know, self-fulfilling. So yes, I think there is a risk that some of it, you know, that in the ideal case, you don't spend a penny, investors stay in, and it's all fine. Uh, in the reality is you'll probably have to spend more than a penny and go above the capital key, but that doesn't worry me too much. And it's an investor of last resort. Yes. Uh, a related question is on, I mean, you, you, so, so far the ECB has intervened on a large scale, like other central banks, um, should and would it be more desirable for European countries to support each other first at the fiscal level, and then this would be followed by ECB support? So this speaks to this discussion on should it be ECB yeah. intervention or Corona bonds? Yes, uh, I mean I think that again, if I was a hundred percent sure 
that that was sustainable in Italy. I would say why you know why have corona bonds? I'm just you know no need. But I'm not you know I'm 98% sure <laughs> something like this, right? So it's clear that anything we can do to mutualize some of the risk and make it you know make the percentage go from 98 to 100 uh, is worth it. So yes, I would much prefer to have seen your bonds in the past to see them now to see corona bonds and then the ECB kind of plays you know the role of eliminating the bad equilibrium and yes mutualization is clearly desirable but we know the political constraints so what I'm saying is the ECB intervention is second best it may be sufficient it may not uh, I think that that's the best which could be done under the circumstances I hope that doesn't need uh, you know the Europeans not not to be more ambitious there's always the risk that when you basically you know uh, kind of repair something, uh, it leads to less pressure to do more. That may be, uh, it may be that the ECB could have, could have kind of bluffed, you know, say, sorry guys, we can't do it. And then I suspect we, should have, we, should, we would have seen corona bonds, we would also have seen spreads in Italy going to, uh, you know, to many hundreds. Uh, that was the other way of playing it, uh, too risky for me. I'm happy that the ECB did it, but it's not first best. Um, so you tackled kind of three areas. Um, uh, Florian Haider, he was wondering whether, especially for Europe, we should also worry about a fourth dimension, which is cross-country divergences in terms of solidarity. So how, how, how concerned are you about um, solidarity kind of uh, not uh, coming together around this problem? Again, I think Italy can do it without either euro bonds or straight transfers from other countries. I, you know, most countries are affected, but it's true that Germany is less affected than Italy, right? So even there, we get the old asymmetry. Uh, I'm all in favor of transfers, gifts, help. Uh, the point is, I think Italy can make it with very limited transfers, very limited help. And again, anything that Europe can do to make sure that the weakest are helped is good. That's a political issue. I mean, we, we can't be, uh, I think the only thing I can say is I think Italy can do it without, uh, and rather have it do it with. Um, and then... Uh... I mean, there is basically a larger issue, which is the general issue of solidarity uh, in, the, in the European Union. I mean, this, if the European Union doesn't show solidarity in this case, then people, you know, will go back to why are we belonging to the European Union. So I think there is a, another dimension which is much larger, and that clearly is important. Yes. So maybe this was the fourth dimension which was yeah. in the question. That that was what was in the question. More looking forward. So um, and then uh, from my end, sort of uh, also looking forward. Once we hopefully make this crisis, um, I remember when you came to the IMF, you you drew a long list of 10 questions on the wall. These are sort of the big questions for the future, and I still remember some of those. Um, what, what are the big questions for the economists going forward? I mean, this, this crisis is going to, is it going to change your textbook in a which way? No, I don't think so. I mean, you know, in the textbook, there'll have to be basically, the textbook was very much written having either demand shocks, kind of the standard ones, or supply shocks, but supply shocks which did something to potential, but didn't prevent the economy to exceed potential. So it was not a major change, right? When there's an oil price change, we can continue to operate at the same level, and it may create inflation, and that's the job of the central bank. But it's not fundamentally different from, you know, just a shift in, in the uh, natural rate of unemployment. But what we have learned is that we can have these shocks, which are basically hard constraints on potential, right, and hard constraints on actual. And I think that, you know, I'll have to have a chapter or a section. Beyond this, I, I'm not so sure. What I think is, and I've just started basically organizing something on, on, on that, which is that all these big challenges that we were talking about before, global warming, uh, aging, inequality, which we didn't take 
you know, we took seriously as economists, but policymakers didn't take seriously enough. I think there'll be a sense that if you wait for the last minute, then there's a big issue. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that when the smoke clears, uh, we'll basically kind of go further on, you know, the carbon tax, on inequality. I mean, this crisis showed, you know, that inequality can show up in many ways. I mean, basically, the people are dying now are people who basically were forced to work. Uh, people like you and me, you know, have stayed home, are probably free for the time being. Uh, so I, I hope that it's more that, that basically we're more forward-looking and, and being willing to take hard measures to basically deal with the future. I mean, this one is interesting, which is how do we basically prepare for the pandemic? And yeah, we can have more masks. Uh, but it's clear that we can't operate hospitals at half capacity in normal times just to have the margin, right? So the whole issue of, and this is kind of a micro-macro issue, the whole issue of scaling up, which we see in all dimensions, you know, and the time it takes for food to come to your place when you order it, because they are completely overwhelmed. And so scaling up at all dimensions is a big issue. And maybe we have to think about, you know, our ability to scale up when there is a shock of that type. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting issue. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, again, we can't be completely prepared, is the point. I mean, even if we had known the pandemic was coming, maybe we would have had more masks. But we would not have had all the ventilators because they would have been waiting, you know, in some storage room and probably becoming obsolete. So. We have to admit that there are going to be shocks where the scaling up is very hard, but maybe we can do better. But beyond this, whether we're going to be changed human beings or not, I'm a bit skeptical. I, I feel that I have not changed very much yet. Maybe I will. Maybe once we get outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Olivier, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. Um, okay, I'm, I'm happy to have... Uh, let me just say, I'm, I'm happy to have bilateral interactions with anybody who didn't get an opportunity to ask a question. It's not that my email inbox is, is empty, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer interesting questions. Okay. Yeah, there were there are 40 people on the line, and we will upload your presentation now for everyone else in the ECB. It's also a videotape for the colleagues who could not. It was an over demand, but uh, thank you very much. Okay. To those uh, that are interested in the webinars, uh, tomorrow uh, Daryl Duffy will speak uh, on the financial system issues. So Olivier, with that, goodbye and uh, stay healthy. Same to you. Same to you all. Bye. Bye now.